This is Lesson 611, Reasons for Exploration. And we've got some explorers here and a very special kind of vessel. What will we be able to explain? Europeans exploring the East and the West, the three Gs, advances in navigational technology, the caravel, the sextant, which is better than the astrolabe, the Chinese compass, Portugal, Prince Henry the Navigator, Bartolomeo Diaz, Vasco da Gama, Spain, Christopher Columbus, the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Dutch East India Company, the British, and the French. The three G's, gold, God, and glory. Gold, God, and glory is often given as the three main reasons for European exploration and colonization throughout the world, though it's an extreme oversimplification. But let's start with the three G's and go from there. Gold. There was a desire for new sources of gold and silver in Europe. These metals were essential for trade. Stores of gold could provide wealth and security for a nation. God, the desire to spread Catholicism. The continuous military victories of the Muslim Ottoman Turks against the Christian kingdoms in the East made Europeans very anxious and eager for Christianity to find success anywhere it could. There had also been rumors of a large, powerful, hidden Christian kingdom somewhere out there, led by a mysterious king named Prester John, who could perhaps help Europeans deal with the Ottomans. The Reconquista was also happening in Spain and Portugal, and this was a centuries-long crusade to drive the Islamic kingdoms, the Moors, out of the Iberian Peninsula, where Spain and Portugal are. And this created not only Christian fervor, but also feelings of nationalism. And for now, let's just define this as extreme patriotism in Spain. The Catholic or Counter-Reformation was happening. The Catholic Church had managed to rally itself and pull itself together in response to the Protestant Reformation. And we will study all of these things, the Catholic Reformation, in more detail soon. The Catholic Church had reaffirmed its identity, its values, and its mission. The Catholic Church, through various highly energized missionary orders, such as the Jesuits, were determined to spread the Catholic version of Christianity all over the world, especially in newly discovered places. Spain and Portugal were both very Catholic countries. Glory. Explorers, soldiers, and monarchs wanted glory for themselves and their nations through profitable trade and conquest. The pursuit and celebration of human individual potential and achievement was a value that the Renaissance had encouraged. Other factors besides the three G's. The locations of Spain and Portugal, for example, these countries were on the western edge of Europe. They lay directly on the Atlantic Ocean. And so the Spanish and Portuguese had an Atlantic orientation rather than a Mediterranean orientation like the Italians did. Europeans also wanted easier and more direct trade with Asia. Europeans wanted direct access to the spices and other goods from the Spice Islands, from China, India, and Africa. And spices had many valuable uses and were worth a lot of money. So we're going to go into a little bit of more detail about spices. What is the big deal about spices? Why go halfway around the planet and put yourself in harm's way just to make your food taste a little better? Well, let's talk about Europe and spices. Spices were held in near mystical reverence by Europeans. People believed that spices possessed rare beneficial qualities, and the European demand for spices was insatiable, which means it could not be satisfied. Spices were thought to have religious origins. The true source of spices was unknown to Europeans, and Europeans thought that if you were to trace the origin of spices and gems to their ultimate source, you'd find the Garden of Eden. The uses for spices were practically unlimited. Some spices increased the appetite in spite of the bland European food. Some spices disguised the taste of old meat. Some spices countered nausea from drinking the bad water. Some spices were balms for soothing and healing. Camphor was thought to have more virtues than it was possible to count. 
Cardamom had lots of varied effects. Cloves were great for the liver, the heart, and for coughs. Ginger was great as a medicine and on food. Nutmeg and mace prevented vomiting and steadied the heart. Spices could even be used as currency. They could be used to pay tribute to religious authorities. In some countries, they could be used to pay taxes. But the most valuable spice of all was pepper. In fact, dear as pepper was a popular term in France. A serf could buy his freedom with one pound of pepper. It could be used for insect stings. It made a great ointment. It could be used to fight colds. It was used to make food taste better. But the most important use of pepper was the preserving of meat. Life in Europe, especially in the country of Portugal, was very harsh. Superstition, brutality, disease, and poverty all shortened the lives of millions of people. Winters were long and hard and full of sickness and death. And feed for your animals was insufficient for the winter. You had to kill and eat your excess animals in the fall because you didn't have enough to feed them through the winter. So people's winter diet lacked nutrition. A declining population was a huge threat for any lord. If you were a landed nobleman, you needed healthy humans to work the land, pay the taxes, and serve in the army. War, disease, and starvation took a massive toll on the population. A population that suffered this much became uneasy and restless, and you had to find a way to feed these people or very bad things could happen, especially in the towns where it was crowded. Importing grain to feed people could be a huge drain on the economy. All of these critical problems could be greatly reduced by pepper. Pepper could be used to preserve meat far into the winter months. If you could do that, people could actually have meat to eat in the winter. More meat meant a larger, healthier population. But the hated infidel, the Ottoman Empire, blocked the way overland to these very valuable spice markets. There are three things to understand about the Ottoman Turks. Number one, they are an Islamic empire. Their rulers are Muslims. Number two, they control the trade routes between Europe and Asia. And number three, Ottoman merchants jacked up the prices of spices that passed through their territory many times. Because of the Ottoman Empire, pepper was both costly and scarce in Europe. There was never enough, and it was never at an acceptable price. As you can see, finding a way around the Ottoman Empire to Asia would solve a lot of very serious problems. And everybody knew that the nation that controlled such a trade route, if such a trade route even existed at all, would be the richest, most powerful nation in Europe. But Europeans knew that if there was a trade route south around Africa from Europe to the Indian Ocean, it would be a total game changer. So they looked for a way around the southern tip of Africa. At the time, Europeans didn't even know whether or not there was a southern tip of Africa. They could only hope there was a southern tip of Africa. New sailing technologies allowed European explorers to go further. The Chinese magnetic compass helped them navigate better. The Islamic astrolabe helped also this instrument helped sailors measure how far north or south they were which was eventually replaced by the more accurate quadrant this was eventually replaced by the even better sextant but the most important development was a type of ship called the caravel it was a small highly nimble ship it had a latine sail which made it better for tacking it had a rear rudder which made it more maneuverable it had an ellipsoidal hull which made it steadier in rough seas, and it needed far less crew. There were no oars, and so there were no rowers to feed. The Mediterranean galley versus the smaller but more seaworthy caravel. The galley was meant for rowing, whereas the caravel was designed to capture even the slightest breeze. The beginning. Interest in the wider world started in the 1200s. 
a merchant from Venice, Marco Polo, returned from China in the year 1295 after spending 24 years traveling in the Far East. And he published stories of his travels, including his 17 years working for the great Mongol emperor Kublai Khan. Marco Polo described magnificent cities and an amazing abundance of valuable goods. And these fantastic Marco Polo stories circulated around the courts of Europe for about 150 years. In Europe, there was a growing demand for the kinds of goods that Marco Polo described in his accounts of traveling around Asia. And these accounts led Europeans to search for routes to Asia which might avoid hostile Islamic states like the Ottoman Empire. And the effort was led by the Spanish and the Portuguese. Explorers. Let's start with Prince Henry the Navigator, who lived from 1394 to 1460. Who would have thought that Portugal, a tiny, poor nation of about one million people, would establish a world empire? Henry wasn't known as the Navigator until the 19th century. He was a war hero to his people, and his people lovingly knew him as the Infant, because he was the youngest of three brothers, including the king, the oldest brother. He was very close to his two older brothers. Three of them actually made a great team. But the most important thing that Prince Henry the Navigator did was organize exploration of the African coastline. He sent expedition after expedition down the coast of Africa in order to try to find the southern tip of it. And he methodically and meticulously collected all kinds of data about Africa, such as winds, currents, waters, people, the climate, the weather, the coastline, etc. Why? He wanted prosperity for his country, gold, slaves, spice, expansion. And because of his religion, he wanted to flank the Muslim empire. He wanted to bring the heathen to Christianity, wherever, wherever heathens might be found. And each successive ship that he sent down the coast of Africa got a little bit farther and was built a little bit better. The first really huge payoff of Henry the Navigator's efforts was the successful mission of Bartolomeo Diaz. He was a Portuguese navigator, and in 1488 he took two caravels and a support ship on an all-out mission to find the southern tip of Africa. He was determined not to turn back around before succeeding. It was an extremely tough and hazardous journey. Diaz finally found the bottom tip of Africa in the year 1488. He was the first European to reach the Indian Ocean this way. And Diaz actually wanted to go further, but his officers refused, saying that they had accomplished their mission, and it was more important to take this amazing news back home. Hey, if they kept on going and they all died, Portugal would never know that he had found the tip of Africa. Diaz called the tip of Africa the Cape of Good Hope. And I love this picture on the bottom right of Diaz looking out at the Indian Ocean, wishing that he could keep going, but knowing that he can't. The Portuguese sat on this incredible sacred that they had actually found their way around Africa to the Indian Ocean for several years. And then, of all people, Christopher Columbus showed up in Lisbon Harbor in Portugal. He was in one ship. He was escaping a storm that he had encountered in the Atlantic Ocean. And he was on his way back to Spain from an amazing voyage of discovery of his own. The king of Portugal, John II, sent one of his top officials out to Columbus's ship to find out who the captain of this ship was and where it had been and where it was going, etc., and that top official was none other than Bartolomeo Diaz himself. King John II and Diaz, they already knew Columbus personally. Columbus had spent years in Portugal trying to convince King John II to fund the voyage that he had just made. But they didn't think Columbus had been to Asia. However, it was very clear to everyone that Columbus had been to some previously undiscovered 
place. And that's when the Portuguese decided that they had to make the most of Diaz's discovery before somebody else did, because other people were out there exploring as well. And it was time to send a brave Portuguese explorer all the way to India. Their man was Vasco da Gama. He was, of course, Portuguese, and da Gama left Portugal in the year 1497 with four ships and 170 men. He was gone for two years and four days. He rounded Diaz's Cape of Good Hope and then went on. And here's a terrific book about Vasco da Gama's voyage, if you're into that sort of thing, Ronald Watkins' Unknown Seas. Great book. Once he was in the Indian Ocean, da Gama then had to deal, lie, trick, and often fight his way up the East African coast against the various local peoples and cities that he met. Muslim Indian Ocean traders knew exactly what they were seeing as soon as they saw European ships sailing up the African coast. They were seeing a threat to their trade monopoly. Da Gama's expedition made it to Calicut, India in the year 1498, and in India, da Gama and his men traded whatever they could for as much spice as they could get their hands on. They had very little gold to trade with, which was just about the only thing that Indian merchants wanted. Vasco da Gama and his men spent months in India learning as much about Indian trade and culture as they could. Da Gama finally got back to Portugal in 1499 with two ships and a lot less men and enough spice on those ships to cover the entire cost of the voyage. The Portuguese public was astonished. They had thought for sure that da Gama and all his men were long dead. Vasco da Gama became a national hero. And the following year, the Portuguese mounted a huge expedition to India with practically every ship they had. Vasco da Gama's amazing achievement was as big a deal as landing on the moon today. Vasco da Gama proved that trade with the East was possible via the Cape route around Africa. And the price of spices in Europe went down to about 20% of what they were before. Da Gama established the foundation for a Portuguese world trading empire. Portugal had great advantages regarding shipbuilding, weapons, and navigation. They established trading forts all along the African coast. Tremendous wealth and power came to this tiny country of Portugal, but they never got a monopoly on Indian Ocean trade. Other European countries, especially Spain, noticed all of this success. Christopher Columbus. Columbus was an Italian explorer living at first in Portugal, then he moved to Spain, and for a long time Columbus had been thinking about reaching Asia by sailing west across the Atlantic. Since the planet is round, this should work, in theory. In fact, the Vikings had already sailed across the Atlantic and discovered America, Newfoundland. But most historians believe Columbus did not know about the Vikings' previous discovery. Columbus' idea was not an original one. Other explorers had tried sailing west across the Atlantic, but they had always had to turn back around before reaching anything. They feared running out of food and running out of fresh water. But Columbus was convinced that if you could just be bold enough to keep going, you would reach Asia before your supplies ran out. However, Columbus' view of the Earth was extremely flawed. This is what Columbus thought the Earth looked like. Columbus didn't know about America, and he didn't know about the Pacific Ocean. Columbus believed that Japan lay 1,500 miles off the coast of Asia, which was inaccurate. And Columbus believed that the distance from the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa to Japan was about 2,400 miles. Columbus had a lifelong fascination for biblical texts and biblical prophecies. And in the book of 2 Esdras, in chapter 6, verse 42, Columbus read this verse. On the third day you commanded the waters to be gathered together in a seventh part of the earth, but you made six parts dry. Columbus took this verse to mean that there can't be that much more undiscovered water out there, so the Atlantic must be pretty narrow. 
both the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches reject the book of 2 Ezra, so you won't find this verse in your Bible at home. No one in Europe knew about America or the Pacific Ocean, but European experts already had a very accurate idea of how big the Earth was, and they already knew that Japan was more like around 10,600 miles from the Canary Islands, not 2,400. No ship could make it that far. You would run out of food and water and die before you got there. And they tried to tell that to Columbus, but you couldn't tell Columbus anything. The two Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, finally funded Columbus's mission. They didn't think Columbus would reach Asia, but they hoped that perhaps Columbus might find something profitable somewhere out there. And besides, their neighbors, the Portuguese, were already aggressively exploring the South Atlantic and Africa. Columbus left Spain with two well-equipped caravels and a slightly larger ship called a carrack, a magnetic compass, an astrolabe, and a quadrant. None of Columbus's ships was called the Mayflower. Yes, I've had lots of 10th grade students who thought that. Columbus's ships were actually called the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. During the voyage, Columbus lied to his men every day about how far they were traveling so that they would not freak out and insist on turning back. Columbus discovered the Americas in 1492, and the world has never been the same since then. Columbus sailed to America a total of four times. Columbus opened the way for further European exploration and eventual colonization of the Americas. So here's the big question that students always think their teachers want to avoid. Did Columbus actually discover America? And that depends on who you ask. If you ask somebody from the old world, and the old world is Europe, Asia, and Africa, they would say yes. They hadn't known about America before Columbus's voyage, and therefore Columbus discovered it for them. If you ask someone from the New World, and that's North America and South America, they would say no, Columbus did not discover America. One third of the Earth's population was already living in the Americas. Their ancestors had discovered America thousands of years before Columbus. They weren't lost. The New World was their Old World. They didn't need to be discovered. They were doing just fine before Columbus showed up. But what if you ask Christopher Columbus himself? What would he have said? Well, he would have said no. He did not discover any new continent. Columbus did not want to believe that he had discovered a vast, previously unknown world. In Columbus's mind, discovering a new continent instead of discovering a way to Asia meant he was a failure, a loser, a fool, and a nobody. And Columbus didn't want to be a failure. So he stubbornly insisted until the day he died in 1506 that he had found a direct route to Asia. And that's why America is named after someone else and not Christopher Columbus. Vasco da Gama is reported to have once said this about his fantastic voyage to India. We didn't just discover India. India also discovered us. And perhaps you could also apply that to Columbus's voyage to America and say this, Columbus didn't just discover America, America also discovered Europe. The Treaty of Tordesillas. By 1494, after Columbus's discovery, Portugal and Spain realized that they needed to stay out of each other's way in the exploration and conquest business. With the Pope's help, Spain and Portugal were both Catholic countries, they signed several treaties. The most famous of these treaties was the Treaty of Tordesillas. In the Treaty of Tordesillas, Spain and Portugal divided the entire planet in half between just the two of them. A line was drawn down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and at the time they still had very little idea of how much was actually out there. But this treaty needed to be in place now. 
Spain would get anything that might be discovered west of that line, and Portugal would get anything that might be discovered east of that line. No other nations were recognized in the treaty, and other nations, like England and France and the Netherlands, may simply ignore the treaty. Other nations competing with Spain and Portugal. Let's start with the Dutch Republic. The Dutch began sending commercial spice expeditions to the Indian Ocean soon after the Dutch Republic was formed in 1581. And in 1602, the Dutch formed a company called the Dutch East India Company. So let's talk about this Dutch East India Company. It lasted almost 200 years from 1602 to 1800. It was one of the first publicly traded companies, meaning that the general public could buy stock ownership in it. And it became the most valuable company of all time. It would be worth $7.9 trillion in today's money. Way, way more than Apple or Google or Amazon or Disney or Walmart. It had as many as 20,000 ships. On the surface, the Dutch East India Company was a simple shipping and trading company, kind of like the way Amazon started out. But in reality, the Dutch East India Company had many more powers and functions than a normal company. For example, it could wage war against other countries. It could imprison and even execute convicts. It could negotiate treaties with other countries. It could mint its own coins. It could establish colonies around the world. It was an early transnational corporation, and it was the Dutch Republic's main instrument of warfare. In this picture, you can see all the stuff that they traded in the East, especially spices. And you'll need to be able to find this area, the East Indies here, on a world map. The English and the French. The English also had an East India Company, and they used that company to establish colonies in India. And its purpose was to compete with the Dutch and the Portuguese for trade in India. The French also managed to establish a trading company in India.